Okay, so this is a website, uh, I mean a YouTube channel by the Reformed Apologetics Ministry. He created a, a video called Black Hebrew Israelites Debunked. And so what he does is, okay, he'll take a, a image of some Hebrew Israelites in their flashy outfits and by association uh, discredit the claim that the Negro is the true Hebrew Israelite. Uh, he also goes on to attack unrelated topics such as the 12 tribe chart, which is easily uh, attacked and discredited. Okay, uh, and so by association, which is really is called a red herring in uh, modern terms. Uh, so by putting out uh, this bait, he uses that to discredit the uh, claim that the Negro is the true Hebrew Israelite of the Bible. Okay, uh, so um, you know we can ignore the twelve tribe chart because. Uh, it's, this is about a family. This is about Jacob and his four wives, Bilhah, Zilpah, Leah, and Rachel. Okay. Uh, and so uh, instead of me running after these uh, loosely associated claims, uh, I'm going to give him things that he needs to address. Okay. One thing he did say also was that the Negro is a Cushite. Okay. Now he has no supporting evidence of that. Uh, but he makes that claim, right? This is dishonest journalism, dishonest research. Uh, this guy is not honest, okay? And then when you post your rebuttal, he says you didn't watch the video, okay? When you're addressing stuff in the video, okay, uh, he's dishonest. So uh, with that, let me begin. So as I said, uh, this guy used a red herring. So uh, this is what I... Uh, I say in regards to that, if you're going to debunk something, then debunk the information and do not pull red herrings out of your hat. Attacking a group of people or attacking the 12 tribe chart, which is easy pickings and yet does not prove or disprove anything. If you are going to debunk something, then debunk the historical or biblical information that is presented as fact. Putting your sight onto false targets is simply disinformation and seems to promote a malicious agenda. You now have an insurmountable challenge before you now because I'm going to bring it to you. I'm going to give you everything that you need to address to prove one way or another that the Negro is or is not the true Hebrew Israelite of the Bible. Okay, uh, and so a red herring is something, especially a clue, that is or is intended to be misleading or distracting. So he tries to distract you, as I said, with images and false accusations. Okay, and if, if you want to watch his video, I'm going to tell you, it's hard to go through. It's hard to endure the dishonest, uh, non-scientific approach to research. Okay, so let's begin. The following is a flurry of data that I'm hitting with that must be answered in order to prove that those in Jerusalem today are the true Hebrew Israelites of the Bible and not the Negroes who are scattered around the world. Okay, one, Israel is scattered around the world, right, to the four corners of the earth, as Scripture said. Not only were they scattered, they were scattered via ship. They were sent into those nations as captives. So this guy says the Assyrians did the scattering. Okay, well, show me where the Assyrians scattered the Israelites via ship. Show me where the Israelites, I mean, show me where the Israelites were scattered and, and sent into the nations of the world as captives. Show me that, okay? See, I don't see any data where the Assyrians needed a ship. I don't see any data where the Assyrians scattered them to the four corners of the earth. Did, did the Assyrians go to India? Did the Assyrians go to Europe? Nope. Okay, dishonest. So if you say that Assyria scattered Israel, then provide your evidence. Prove that they used ships to scatter Israel to all the nations of the earth. This requires you to prove that Israel went to America, India, Europe, China, Brazil, Canada, Australia. Because the Negro is right now scattered to the four corners of the earth. They went there by ship as slaves. So prove that the Syrian captivity can be applied to Job 3 as well, where the Lord fights the nations for his people whom they scatter to the nations. 
this guy says that the Assyrians did this scattering. Well, guess what, dude? It ain't finished. Job 3 is a future prophetic event. There is not a prophetic scholar in the, on the planet that does not admit that this is a future event. Okay? Now, how does this apply to those scattered to the four corners of the earth as slaves? By the Assyrians? Show me that. Okay, because here's Job 3 1 for you. For behold, in those days and in that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. Okay? I want to see how that works with the Assyrian concept or theory. Because it doesn't. Okay, sorry, I'm trying to adjust this. Okay. okay, additional evidence of the scattering. Isaiah eleven twelve. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcast of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Jeremiah fifteen four. And I will cause them to be removed into all kingdoms of the earth because of Manasseh, the son of Hezekiah, king of Judah, for that which he did in Jerusalem. Jeremiah 30, 11, For I am with thee, said the Lord, to save thee, though I make a full end of all nations, whether I have scattered thee, yet will I not make a full end of thee, but I will correct thee in measure, and will not leave thee altogether unpunished. Okay, nations, not a nation, not Assyria, the nations. Okay. Deuteronomy 4.27. And the Lord shall scatter you among the nations, and ye shall be left few in number among the heathen, whether the Lord shall lead you. Okay. Nehemiah 1.8. Remember, I beseech thee, the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If ye transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. Okay. Now this is not on your screen. Luke 21.24. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down by, of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Okay, so when was the time of the Gentiles fulfilled? Okay. When was the Assyrians led to all nations, not just led and scattered, right? They weren't just scattered. They were led away captive. That's what is going to destroy this guy's argument right here. It's not just a scattering, right? This is the weak argument that people who want to deny that the Negro is a true Hebrew Israelite, right? They, they want to say, oh, well, they were scattered to the world and we don't know where they are. No, they were scattered as slaves and sent as slaves to those nations. So now if you are able to somehow get past the impossible task of showing that any other group of people were scattered via ship to the four corners of the earth, then I now present to you your next proof. You must now address what historians and travelers have said in their own writings. Okay, the travels of Ludovico di Vortima, okay, 1503 to 1508. At the end of the eighth day we found a mountain which appeared to be 10 or 12 miles in circumference in which mountain there dwell four or five thousand Jews who go naked and are in height five or six spans and have a feminine voice and are more black than any other color. They live entirely upon the flesh of sheep and eat nothing else. They are circumcised and confess that they are Jews and if they can get a more into their hands they will skin them alive. Okay. Bavantina. Okay, many of you guys have seen this in other videos, but this is for our uh, so-called debunker. Bavantina etched the image of the Sphinx of Giza around 1798. This image below and written account is from 1803, the issue of Universal Magazine. What is most intriguing is that Dinan does not mention any damage to the nose or lips of the Sphinx. From that same magazine, here's the written account. 
about the Sphinx of the Giza Dinan's own words. Okay, so now we're talking about the Egyptians because this guy says that the Egyptians are a white race. Okay, so here we go. Though its proportions are colossal, the outline is pure and graceful. The expression of the head is mild, gracious, and tranquil. The character is African, but the mouth and lips of which are thick has a softness and delicacy of execution truly admirable. It seems real life and flesh. Art must have been at a high pitch when the mountain was executed for. If the head wants what is called style, that is to say, the straight and bold lines which give expression to the figures under which the Greeks have designated their deities, yet sufficient justice has been rendered to the fine simplicity and character of nature which is displayed in this figure. Okay, here we go. Uh, Hebrewisms of West Africa by Joseph J. Williams. Close up of the Ashanti priest. Notice his head cover and especially his breastplate necklace. The breastplate contains 12 Jews. Three are arranged across in four horizontal rows. This is exactly according to the breastplate design for the high priest of Israel. Exodus 28, 15-27. And although any Israelite may wear a head cover Israelite priests must wear head covers when on duty so Joseph Williams knew these people were descendants of the people in the Bible the bulletin society langui dossier de geography okay the translation is below to your right Weda, Fida, Weda, Weda, Judah, a Judah is an ancient city, frequented since the 16th century by Portuguese slave traders who gave it its name. Its inhabitants were said Judaic, and indeed were viewed as a remnant of scattered tribe of Israel. Imagine that. The Universal Geography by Elise Recluse. Okay, this is 1800s. East of Great Popo begins the Dahomey territory guarded by the important town of Glenway, known to Europeans by the various names of Fida, Havida, Wida, Wida. The old writers called it Judah, and its inhabitants were said to be Jews, while the neighboring river Alala, whose real name is Ephra, became the Euphrates. That's page 267. Okay. The next one. Okay. The Mandingans, who are now broken up into many rival petty states, are excellent husbandmen, but display their remarkable talent chiefly as traders. They have been compared to the Seracole, the Jews of West Africa, page 175. Okay, now page 410. A part of the local trade is in the hands of the Mavumbas, a people of grave and solemn aspect with intelligent eyes, straight or even aquiline nose, equiline nose, whose pronounced Semitic type has earned for them the Portuguese designation of Judeo Pritos, or black Jews. Okay. The Zondervan Dictionary of Bible and Theology Words. Okay, remember, this guy said that the Negro is a Cushite. No experience, no degree, no real skill in doing any research. Yet, he says the Negro is a Cushite. Well, guess what? Zondervan disagrees with him. Ham, the youngest son of Noah, born probably about 96 years before the flood and one of eight persons to live through the flood. He became the progenitor of the dark races, not the Negroes, but the Egyptians, the Ethiopians, Libyans, and Canaanites. So, Zondervan agrees. Okay, how will you respond? Are they crazy? Is that the answer that this guy is going to give us? Oh, but Zondervan doesn't know what they're talking about. Okay, but they got a team of professional historians on their side. But this guy will say Zondervan doesn't know what they're talking about. Okay, because guess what? What's left? 
if the Negro is not of Ham, he's of Shem or Japheth. Well, guess what? That rules out Japheth because everyone knows that the white man comes from Japheth. So guess what? The Negro is a Shemite. The majority of people say the Judeans were those Ethiopians whom fear and hatred obliged to change their habitation in the reign of King Cephas. This is by Tacitus. Tacitus, this was a second-hand account. Okay, he, he, he didn't know or meet the Hebrews, the Judeans. But he said the majority of people whom he talked to say the Judeans were those Ethiopians. Okay, it's, it, it, you know, hey, Satan deceived the whole world, so I guess, uh, you know, he definitely wants to destroy Israel because when Israel wakes up, the end of the world is at hand. Okay, and the end of the Gentile rule is definitely at hand. Okay, so now let's talk a little more about the Egyptians. Herodotus. Long before the Arab invaded and conquered Egypt, the famous and ancient Greek historian Herodotus, who is known as the father of history, visited Egypt and wrote concerning the Egyptians. They have burnt skin, flat noses, thick lips, and woolly hair. Now this guy says he addressed that. Hey, how do you address that? Who has burnt skin, flat noses, and thick lips, and woolly hair? Wouldn't you think anything other than the truth is a lie, right? How will he address that? It ain't worth uh, it ain't worth uh, paying attention to this guy. Okay, M. Constantine de Volney traveled through Syria and Egypt in the years 1783, 84, and 85. He said, "Just think." De Volney declared incredulously that this race of black men today, our slave, and the object of our scorn, is the very race to which we owe our arts, sciences, and even the use of speech. What happened to the Negro that, that didn't invent anything and was uh, swinging from trees and bushes? Obviously, that's not the case, huh? Just imagine finally that it is in the midst of people who call themselves the greatest friends of liberty and humanity that one has approved the most barbarous slavery and questioned whether black men have the same kind of intelligence as whites. In other words, the ancient Egyptians were true Negroes of the same stock as all the authors. Autochronous people of Africa, and from the datum one sees how their race, after some centuries of mixing with the blood of the Romans and Greeks, must have lost the full blackness of its original color, but retained the impress of its original mold. So as I said in my previous show, he said, hey, they're Negro. Okay, yes, they may have intermingled a little bit with the Romans and the Greeks, but they maintained their original mold. They still had Negro features. Okay, that's M. Constantine de Volney, Travels Through Syria and Egypt. Okay, we have other quotes. Okay, um, by, uh, here's one by uh, Diodorus. He said, they say also that the Egyptians are colonists sent out by the Ethiopians, Osiris having been the leader of the colony. And notice these Greek and Roman statues, please. Have you been lied to? Looks like it. Now, okay, Dr. Chica Ante Dia. Okay. Now, this guy at the so-called debunker said that Diop is not credible. Okay. Now, where's the scientific proof of that? Okay. Obviously, that's a racist statement if he has no scientific proof. Okay. Diop ran test, invented test, and proved the race of the Egyptians. Okay, so based on his review of scientific literature, Diop concluded that most of the skeletons and skulls of the ancient Egyptians clearly indicate they were Negroid people with features very similar to those of modern black Nubians and other people of the Upper Nile in East Africa. He called attention to studies that included examinations of skulls from the pre-dynastic period that showed a greater percentage of black characteristics than any other type. Melanin dosage test, Diop invented a method for determining the level of melanin in the skin of human beings. Melanin is the chemical responsible for skin pigmentation and it and is preserved for millions of years in the skins of fossil animals. 
The app conducted the melanin test on Egyptian mummies at the Museum of Man in Paris and determined the levels found in the dermis and epidermis of a small sample would classify all ancient Egyptians as unquestionably among the black race. Osteological evidence according to Diop, osteological measurements, analysis of bones, or perhaps the least misleading of the criteria accepted in physical anthropology for classifying the races of men. A first study of this kind was completed by a German archaeologist called Richard Lepsius at the end of the 19th century. The Lepsius canon, which distinguishes the bodily proportions of various racial groups cate categories, the ideal Egyptian as short arm and of negroid or negrito physical type. So I guess uh, Lepsius is not credible along with Dia, right? Based on what? Evidence from blood type. Diop found that even after hundreds of years of intermixing with foreign invaders, the blood type of modern Egyptians is the same group B as the populations of Western Africa on the Atlantic seaboard and not the A2 group characteristic of the white race prior to any crossbreeding. Okay, so they were African, Western African. Okay, so guess what? Ramses III had his DNA tested by uh, the uh, DNA group and came back as E1B1A, right, which is West Africa, okay, which is the majority of people in uh, the western part of Africa. So that was his haplogroup. Ramses III was E1B1A, not European. I'm looking for the debunker to debunk this because he can't. Okay, so Diop noted that Egyptians had only one term to designate themselves, and that's KMT Kemet, which literally means the blacks. This is the strongest term existing in the pharaonic tongue to indicate blackness. So, DNA tribes, these are the same people who did Ramsey's uh, DNA test. DNA tribes, a genomics company that specializes in tracing individual ancestry to certain global populations, has recently subjected the published STR profiles of feral Tutankhamun and family to analysis. They report that the closest living relatives of the mummies are sub-Saharan Africans, especially those from southern Africa and the Great Lakes region. The company also tested the STR profile of Ramses III and found that among present-day populations, Ramses' autosomal STR profile is most frequently found in the African Great Lakes region, where it is approximately 335.1 times as frequent as in the world as a whole. So it's more frequent in Africa, West Africa as a whole. Why? Because his haplogroup is E1B1A. Okay, so, you know, you can't... Um, Debunk this, right? This is factual research. I didn't make it up. Here's uh, some mummies we want to look at. Look at that mummy right there on the table. Black man. Okay. Black woman. Woolly hair. Same woman. Woolly hair. Negro hair. Negro skin. Black skin. Really? Do we even have to go there? Lady Ray was an ancient Egyptian woman of the early 18th dynasty who served as nursemaid to Queen Amos Nefertari. Braids, Negro hair, black skin. You can go outside and find black women with their hair braided like that today. But yet people want to say Egyptians were white. Okay, another view of another mummy, braided. Woolly, Negro hair, brown skin, Egyptian. Okay. There are some statues of Africans, I mean of uh, Egyptians in the museum. Brown, dark brown, black skin with an afro, short little fro, like we have today. Negroid lips on the sphinx, right? Negro shaped head. Okay. Does that look like any other race but a Negro race right there? Does it look 
uh, Middle Eastern. Doesn't look like an Ishmaelite. Right? It looks like a hammer. Okay. This wall painting from the tomb of Kedi. This shows Egyptian warriors. You got some brown ones and some black ones, but just like in America today, Israel comes in multiple shades. Okay, look at that. Okay, looks like Negro men to me, right? Okay, look at that nose, Negro nose, dark brown skin, Negro lips. Big eyes, statue of Queen Hassafoot, Egyptian mummy, Cairo, Egypt. Huni is the last pharaoh of the third dynasty. Okay, so you're going to tell me this pharaoh is not black, not an African man. Okay, I mean, keep lying to yourself. Okay, Jedefri, also known as Jedefra was an ancient Egyptian king or pharaoh of the fourth dynasty during the Old Kingdom. He is well known under his Hellenized name, form of Ratoisi. Okay. Anyone's going to say this is someone other than, than a Negro? I don't think so. Another uh, Egyptian statue, Negroid face, Negroid nose, obviously a Negro. I mean, are we going to be honest? Another Egyptian statue in the museum. Negro nose. Obviously a Negro shaped face. A black man's face. African. Ancient Egyptian soldiers of the 11th dynasty. That doesn't look uh, Middle Eastern to me. Doesn't look like an Ishmaelite. Looks like a Hamite. Even though it's a... Uh, uh, s s carved statues, they painted them dark skin. Egypt Aminhotep. Look at that. Does he look like anything but a black man? Okay. There's some more images of black people in the tombs of Egypt. Okay. Theban tomb painting during reign of Pharaoh Ramses II. Ramses II is Moses' adversary. Okay, is this anything but a black man and black woman? Braided hair, dark skin, from Africa. I mean, why? I mean, let's keep it real. With all of this evidence presented, he still can't even get past the basic logic of this, the following. The truth is in our faces to be seen if we were seeking truth. Not everyone is seeking truth. Everyone is trying to promote their own agenda today, but the truth stares you in the face. Okay. One, this is the things you got to reason with. Okay. You have to answer this honestly. Ham is black. Everyone agrees. Cush is black. Everyone agrees. Cush is the son of Ham. He is black. Mizraim, son of Ham, brother of Cush, but they say he's not black. Huh? What? Wait, hold up. Hold up. Are we in the twilight zone? Cush is black. His dad is black. Mizraim is the brother of Cush, son of Ham, but Mizraim is not black? You're lying to yourself. You're being dishonest. Is it on purpose or you've just been brainwashed? Which is it? Okay. Mizraim is the brother of Cush, son of Ham. He has to be black. Furthermore, Ham has to be his brothers. If Ham is black, Shem is black. If Shem is black, Japheth is black. There's no other way around it, which means they were a black family. This is the kind of thing that you have to address in your debunking. Don't waste your time with the other stuff. This is the evidence, my friend. Now let's look at some European maps. You gotta debunk this as well. The heirs of Johann Baptiste Homan of Nuremberg. Look at this here. The homie Judah. Judah. Okay. They call this area Judah. 
They're not the only ones who called this area Judah because they knew who Israel is or was. They knew where Israel went after 70 AD and they labeled it Judah. Printed in London by E. Bowen in 1747. Judah, same territory labeled Judah by the Brits. Okay. The Anvil map of Africa. Okay, the Gorham area. Jews are exiled. So guess what? They said this is where the Jews went. This is where the Jews were exiled to after 70 AD. Right here, same location. Okay, so here's a map. Okay, this is a map of the Duke of Orleans. Okay, now this is hard to read, but this is the map. Okay, it's a nice quality map that you can zoom into, but this is what you're going to see in close up. Okay, let's see here. According to Adrisi, right here, according to Adrisi, the land hereabout was peopled by Jews. This is by the Duke of Orleans, sanctioned by the Duke of Orleans. Okay. Peopled by Jews. So this is where the Hebrew Israelites went after 70 AD, fleeing Rome. The 12 Royumes, okay, this is uh, in French. It means the 12 kingdoms dating from 1700, the work of Guillaume de Lille. Okay, he said, he labeled this same area, for well, the southern area, area, this is where the uh, northern tribe resided. He labeled that the 12 kingdoms, which is so right. At least it should have been labeled the 10 kingdoms, because this is where the northern tribe went. Okay, in, in Judah fled, in 70 AD, but the northern tribe was already there. Okay. The 12 kingdoms. So he said that the Jews, his uh, the Ashkenazi Jews who, who are telling the truth are self-hating Jews. That's how he discredited these guys for going public about their own people. He calls them self-hating Jews with no support just his feeling on the matter. So Slomo San said, the biggest surprise during his research came when he started looking at the archaeological evidence from the biblical era. I was not raised as a Zionist, but like all other Israelis, I took it for granted that the Jews were a people living in Judea and that they were exiled by Romans in 70 AD. Similarly, with the exile, in fact, you can't explain Jewishness without exile. But when I started to look for history books describing the events of this exile, I couldn't find any. Not one. He's a tenured professor at the University of Tel Aviv, but I guess he is a self-hating Jew, which makes him not credible. No, he's telling the truth. Slomo was asked, if most Jews never left the Holy Land, what became of them? It is not taught in Israeli schools, but most of the early Zionist leaders, including David Ben-Gurion, believed that the Palestinians were the descendants of the area's original Jews. They believed the Jews had later converted to Islam. The original nomadic Palestinians were black people. Now, another self-hating Jew, so says this guy, Arthur Ketzler in which he advances the thesis that Ashkenazi Jews are not descended from the historical Israelites of antiquity, but from Khazars, a Turkic people. Ketzler hypothesized that the Khazars, who converted to Judaism in the 8th century, migrated westward into Eastern Europe in the 12th and 13th centuries when the Khazar Empire was collapsing. This was later confirmed by DNA of Eric L. Haig. Okay, so, uh, you know, their own people are going public, revealing the truth that the so-called Ashkenazi are not the people of the book. Doesn't it make sense? 
Israel's whole history has been with Hamite tribes, Cushites, and Mizraim, children of Mizraim, two Hamitic cultures. This is this is Israel's history of marriage and interaction with other cultures. The two main ones are what? Hamitic cultures. But yet we are supposed to believe somehow that Caucasians are the true Hebrews. So Aaron Elhe, Tel Aviv geneticist, okay, he did a study on European Jew population, published in 2012. According to his studies conclusions, European Jews derived from the Caucasus and Mesopotamian population. Okay, you can find that at OxfordJournal.org. He has the complete study. This is the type of thing you must debunk if you're going to debunk anything. Okay, this is hardcore, heavy hitting facts, and I have not seen any such information presented by this guy. Paul Wexler, okay, a te Tel Aviv University linguist. He said in his 93 book, he stated that Ashkenazi Jews could be considered ethnically Slavic. He asserts that the Ashkenazi are not the Mediterranean origin. Considering the logical outcome of his linguistic theories to, the, to be that Ashkenazi Jews are the descendants of Iranian, Turkic, and Slavic proselytes, converts. He has also applied his linguistic theories to Sephardic Jews, suggesting similarly that they are in fact also of non-Jewish origin, originating from Berber proselytes rather than from Spain. These are professional historians, scientists from their own people. Okay. So Remember this, uh, we have in Exodus 4, 6. Again, the Lord said to him, put your hand inside your cloak. And he put his hand inside his cloak. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. Okay, now let's look at the people in Israel today. They're Caucasian, they're white. The man on the left has leprosy or is leprous. The man on the right is leprous. Which one is the miracle? Which one would Pharaoh be amazed at? The one on the right, the black man who became white. Okay, I mean, oh, I mean, my question is, do you want to be honest or are you being a truth seeker or not? So that's all I have. Um, and it's more than enough for the debunker to get to debunking. Okay, this is the challenge. I challenge you, Mr. Thompson. To debunk this information okay you used a red herring you did a sleight of hand you performed misdirection and claimed it was a scholarly piece of work it was not a scholarly piece of work it was horrible it was dishonest so get to debunking I'll be waiting